So for her, the anticipation and validation didn't take place, that process didn't take place at a conscious level of thinking. It was a continuous experience of the world, and the verbal labels only come afterwards when people are asked to explain what they did or to reflect on it. So uh, she was very, very uh, strong in suggesting that the verbally expressed labels that we have for construing uh, doesn't represent the actual experience. And for her, the actual experience, the direct immediate experience, was the core of the construction process. Fits in nicely with Kelly's notion of uh, his theory as a theory of emotion and action rather than a theory of uh, thoughts. Um, her, her productivity was really interesting to me, uh, and I talked about that in the title of my presentation. Uh, over the course of my career, I've known a wide variety of, uh, of psychologists, many of whom have been highly productive, as well as others who are sort of more modestly productive like myself. But many of the people who are highly productive that I've known uh, seem to be working under a great deal of tension and stress and seem to be quite uh, frazzled by uh, how much they're having to work to be productive. Or other people who have been sort of totally workaholic and their entire life was their work. Uh, but I, I didn't see that in Faye. I had limited interactions with her, of course. But um, it always seemed to me that she was relaxed and easygoing. Uh, she was passionate in her commitment to the kind of work that she was doing. But I never saw that sort of sense of, of tension or stress or workaholism in her. But yet she was amazingly highly productive. She really accomplished so much. Her personal life seemed rich and full. She had her hobbies, her interests, her friends, her husband. Um, but she continued this very high level of productivity. I was never able to quite figure out when it was that she managed to do all of this. It's just these books kept coming out, but I don't know how she did it. But I think a lot of it had to do with her ability to collaborate effectively with people and engage other people in her work. Um, you know, she didn't have a strong sense of, of ego about personal ownership of the work. She just wanted to see the theory and the material out there for people. And she didn't necessarily need to call attention to herself. Uh, I'm sure that she worked very hard to do this, but uh, she seemed to engage people in a way that uh, seemed comfortable. Um, it's some, somewhat similar to how I got engaged in doing some teaching without quite knowing that uh, I was doing that. Uh, I experienced that personally a little bit in um, the work with the International Handbook. I was I'm thinking about how she managed to get together all of these people within a relatively short period of time to write all of these chapters in this very good book and get it out published. I was one of the people involved, but it seemed so casual. You know, well, how would you get to write this article, write a chapter for this? And this is all came together. And here was this you know, wonderful piece. The last thing that I noted about her was, as Beverly had talked about, some about her interest in windsurfing and all these activities, was her curiosity and her passion for life, and particularly for learning. She was very humble. She was open-minded. She was willing to take a look at her ideas. Uh, we, uh, we had a, a long exchange of emails over a period of, of several months, just about a year and a half or so before she died. We were talking about some of my conceptual ideas, again, some of my abstract philosophical ideas. We were talking about issues about uh, whether, you know, the, the issue of looking at construing as a direct, immediate personal experience, uh, contrasting it with uh, uh, having uh, concepts and ideas about it and stuff, and pre-verbal construing somewhere in the mix. And, we had this very long email exchange that got so long, we had to create it as an attachment to the emails rather than through the screen. And she had different, different colors for different parts of the exchange to keep the, uh, the dialogue straight. Um, and I, I'm going to close my presentation with two sentences with which she ended one of these exchanges, which for me really characterized her approach. Again, this was, this was in 2009, so this was just a little more than a year before she passed away. She says, what exciting territory we're getting into. I'm learning so much. And that really characterizes me.
my talk is finished and unfinished business, the legacy of faith. If someone passes away at the age of 85, you've seen that picture many times now. After a long and successful career in academia and beyond, the focus is usually on what the deceased has indeed accomplished in her life and not on what she has not achieved. It may seem disrespectful then to look at unfinished business. It is only justified if she or he tells her or himself that there are things left to do. A few weeks before her death, Faye Franzella contacted me and asked for my opinion about whether she should communicate to her friends and the PCP community that she had been diagnosed with cancer. I encouraged her to do so, and on her request and using the words she had suggested, eventually informed our friends and colleagues that she had been told by her doctors that she had months, not years, to look forward to. In that message, she mentioned tidying up and unfinished business. I'll get back to that later. Also, as I'm about to enter my eighth decade, next month I know what I'm talking about. Unfinished business. Now, Faye and me. Unlike many of the people who have commented on Faye's life and work after she passed away, I was not a student of hers and did not receive my PCT foundations from her. I was already in my 40s when I became involved with PVP and had already reached, if I may say so, the peak level of my professional career in my original discipline, medical psychology. Incidentally, Faye's job before she does discovered PCP. Nor did I ever visit Faye at home, at her home, or elsewhere outside the professional context. So I never experienced her hospitality, like so many others who remember her gracious generosity. My relationship with Faye can perhaps be characterized as friendly professional or a professional friendship. We met only at PCP conferences and congresses for the first time at the International Congress in Assisi in 89, my initiation to the international PCP community. But over many years, we have been in continuous email contact about a wide variety of issues, like others and like Spence, apparently. Uh, our relationship was also marked by mutual invitations, albeit asymmetrically so. Faye invited me to contribute to the handbook and I felt honored to be invited to contribute to the symposium celebrating her 80th birthday. I invited her to present keynote addresses at the international PCP conferences I organized, at the second conference in the European Association. <coughs> she spoke about will there PCP in Europe, and at the international congress in 1999 in Berlin, the topic was PCP by the year 2045, as mentioned earlier. It can be seen that it was obvious about her visions, where or whether PCP might go in the years to come. She also contributed papers on Kelly and mathematics and George Kelly and poetry to books that I edited or co-edited, thereby extending the traditional range of application in interesting ways. I might also mention a number of entries she wrote for the International Encyclopedia, Internet Encyclopedia of PCP that I edited with Beverly Walker. Now, academia. Much has been said and written about Faith's lifetime achievements. So I'm just going to summarize and proceed to, in my view, perhaps the most important accomplishment. It is well known that Faith started as an occupational therapist, studied psychology, and encouraged by Dawn Bannister, became a promising academic. She published a groundbreaking work on stuttering, which together with the work of Dawn Bannister's and Phil Simmons, Peggy Dalton's, Tom Raveness, Eric Buttons, to name but a few, was seminal in demonstrating to the wider psychological community, especially in the UK, the scientific and practical value of the PCT approach. Together with, together with Don Bannister, she introduced, introduced the academics in old Europe to PCT by publishing Inquiring Man 40 years ago now. 